Perfect. Well, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for, for tuning in to this session um, and to Tom for that introduction and for the, the to the conference organizers for putting on this, this really interesting conference that's been great so far. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about how we could use quantum computers, both the devices we have now and those that we hope to have in the next few years, to try and solve um, problems by learning from chemistry and physics experiments. And the experiments that I'm going to talk about today are muon spin spectroscopy experiments. So this was work uh, done over the course of last year um, while I was at Oxford. Um, so it's, yeah, Oxford affiliated work, that one. Um, so just as a quick outline of the talk, first, um, I'm just going to outline what these muon spectroscopy experiments are, um, how we do them, what sort of things we study, because um, it's not it's not an experimental technique that will necessarily be familiar to everyone. And I'll also touch on like how we analyze these experiments, what we learn from them, and why it can be difficult to analyze these these experiments with classical computers in some circumstances. Uh, I'll then outline a quantum algorithm that we might use to efficiently analyze the data from these muon spectroscopy experiments. And then I'll show some results from um, classical emulations of the quantum algorithm. And then finally, I'll talk about um, what kind of resources we might need to try and um, run this calculation within the next few years. So these, these muon spectroscopy experiments, um, it's a technique that's been around for quite a long time now, for about 40 years or so, so since the 1980s, these techniques have been, been used. And it's a, a really versatile experimental technique that's given uh, insights into a wide range of systems. So condensed matter physics, solid state physics, organic chemistry, um, biochemistry, like radical formation and things. So it's yeah, really like quite broadly applicable technique that shares many similarities with things like NMR uh, or electron spin resonance. So the way these techniques work is that you would go along to a, a particle accelerator um, of, of certain types, which often as like waste products from neutron scattering experiments will produce um, beams of pions. And these pions, when they decay, will produce muons. But I guess more, more specifically, they are producing uh, anti-muons. But we, we never use the regular uh, muon in these experiments. So whenever I say muon in this talk, just implicitly remember that it's, it's an anti-muon. So like cast your mind back to undergrad, undergraduate days. Um, you might remember that the muon is essentially a, a heavy version of the electron. So these, these anti-muons are basically the heavier version of a positron. So they're also spin half particles. They have a, a plus one charge and they basically behave kind of like a light version of a proton. So they, they have a mass one ninth that of the proton. And a fun, like as a curious quirk of the weak interaction, when these muons are produced, they are fully spin polarized, by which I mean like all of the spins of the muons point in the same direction. And that direction is aligned opposite to their direction that their momentum points in. Um, in the diagram, I show them you know, being collinear, but that doesn't make a huge difference here. So what we can do is we can like collimate a beam of these, these muons and we can implant them into some kind of sample of interest. And we find that they're very quickly brought to rest by electrostatic interactions. And those interactions, um, very fortunately, don't depolarize the beam like, at all, really. So the muons are then brought to rest in some, some point that is energetically favorable for them to do so. And we can then kind of consider a, a microscopic model for what's going on. And we can treat our muon as just a spin half particle. And we know that there are some spins associated to the local nuclei in the sample as well. So all of these spins are just going to interact through some you know, dipolar interaction or perhaps like hyperfine coupling. And as a result, the, the spin of the muon, and in particular its projection along um, a given axis, is going to vary in time according to the Schrodinger equation. Now, as this is an experiment, we have to measure something. It's, it's always the case. So we're going to introduce some detectors 
along the muon spin axis. But interestingly, uh, muon spectroscopy isn't a scattering technique like neutron scattering. We never actually measure the muon itself. What instead happens is because the muon is an unstable particle, it will decay after some time, about like two microseconds on average. And it decays into some neutrinos that we're not interested in and a positron. Now again, as a consequence of the weak interaction, this positron is emitted uh, preferentially in the direction of motion that the muon spin was pointing in when it decayed. So for example, in this particular case, we're gonna see the positron exit out the back of the sample and register as a click in one of our detectors. So you can imagine repeating this calculation, this process many, many times with a bunch of different muons, either implanted in the sample one by one, or you, know, you implant a great many in one go. And in general, they're gonna decay at, at different times after they entered the sample. And so if you monitor the difference between say like the forward and backward detector um, and how that changes as a function of time, you can start to build up um, an appropriately normalized count that we call the polarization function of the system. Um, for example, shown here. And mathematically, what the polarization function is essentially telling us is up there in the top left. It's just saying, what is the Z expectation value of the muon uh, at the time when it decayed? And the model that we have in general for these experiments is that we take the muon to be fully spin polarized. So you can see it's just in the plus one Z eigenstate here. Whereas the environment spins are taken to be in the maximally mixed state. Um, and you could consider other models, but the reason we generally consider this is because while these experiments can happen at um, quite low temperatures, uh, in general, the, the temperature that they're at is quite large compared to the, the spacing between the energy levels of, of the nuclear spins. So these, that's kind of the outline of, of how these experiments work. And they can be used to give a lot of different insights into many different physical systems. For example, we can use them to probe um, the structure and formation of vortex lattices in high temperature type two superconductors. We can also use them to investigate uh, phase transitions in low dimensional quantum molecular magnets. These experiments have also been used to study the diffusion of lithium ions in lithium ion batteries to work out how they could be made to charge better. Um, and they've also been used to study the mobility of hydrogenic defects in semiconductors, which could have impacts on like, the efficiency of solar cells. But I think it's not immediately obvious how you know, the simple object like the polarization function that I've just talked about can provide insights onto all these different physical phenomena that I've talked about here. And the way we learn about these quantities is the way we learn about many things in the physical sciences, and it's to compare the output of our experiment to um, some simulated model of the experiment that we have. And as is often the case, there is a whole hierarchy of different methods we could use to try and solve these models. And all of these methods tend to have some accuracy dependent computational cost that limits the maximum system size that we can apply them to. So for example, at the bottom of the hierarchy, we have you know, mean field type methods, which are, are very cheap, but not accurate of all systems that one might consider. So in, you know, if we took an analog to computational chemistry, these are like your density functional theory type methods. And then all the way through to the top, we've got you know, a fully quantum model of the system where we treat all the spins quantum mechanically, and we want to solve all the interactions um, exactly. And you could kind of liken this to like an exact diagonalization approach in quantum chemistry. And much in the same way of those exact diagonalization approaches, these you know, fully quantum models for the system are exponentially costly to solve on classical computers using all known methods. And they normally proceed through like one of two routes. You either do exact diagonalization of the, the spin Hamiltonian of your system so that you can easily compute the time evolution. And you know, those kind of calculations are very costly, even by like exact diagonalization standards. And they're restricted to maybe like 15 spin half particles or so. One can also consider um, some wave function based approaches that are a little bit more sophisticated and have um, a sample dependent error that's controllable as you take more samples. 
Um, because those are wave function based approaches, they're a bit more efficient to implement. And the, the previous record for those kind of methods is about 26 spin half particles. So we're, we're very much limited in the system size. Now, as you can probably imagine, um, you know, given this is a talk about quantum computing, it's these high cost, high accuracy quantum models that I'm going to be talking about and interested in today. And there's a few like main areas within the, the muon literature where these kind of calculations are performed. But um, one of the main areas is in calculations that try and locate where the muon comes to rest and what kind of effect it has on um, the local geometry of the system. So for example, this is a calculation from you know, a, a while ago now that was performed using classical methods um, where they were looking at what effect the muon would have um, on the geometry of a like, low dimensional fluorinated molecular magnet. And for this calculation, you know, they took an experimental polarization function plotted with the, the black crosses, as you can see in the diagram, and then they took a model of the system. So here they were looking at a, a three spin problem, so one muon and two, two fluorine ions. And they parameterized the distances between like the muon and the fluorines and the, the angle that was the, between the two fluorines. And then you can incorporate it into some sort of fitting routine. So you could just perform exact diagonal, get the Hamiltonian at a given geometry, um, do exact diagonalization, get the polarization function, compare that to the, the data via some kind of loss function, um, and then repeat the process you know, through an, an automated optimization loop. And ultimately, you hope you can get some, um, some good fit for the geometry of the system. Um, and this has been done for a number of different systems in the, the muon literature. But what those calculations all tend to have in common is because they're restricted to simulating um, you know, very small system sizes, three spins, you know, certainly a handful of spins, um, it's difficult to recover the behavior of the whole polarization function, which depends on you know, a very large number of spins. So what they do is they typically include some kind of heuristically motivated terms in the polarization function. So for example, multiplying by a, a stretched exponential, um, which helps them get a good fit to the data, but it's kind of indicative that we're not you know, accurately, like completely uh, faithfully reproducing the system's dynamics there. So this kind of gives us the hope that if, you know, if we could do bigger simulations of these systems, perhaps we could get a more accurate modeling of this data. And this is where the hope for quantum simulation of these experiments comes in. So the, I guess the algorithm that I've looked at for this problem is quite a simple one. It can just be written out in this like fake circuit diagram here. And the first step in the process is just like a classical pre-processing step that we do before the, the quantum computation. So we just need to map our um, spin Hamiltonian onto qubit operators. And the approach I took in this problem uh, was to use a Dickey state mapping um, inspired by Baron Coxor's PhD thesis. Um, and you can kind of see intuitively where this arises from. We know if we have um, you know, a pair of spin half particles, they can be partitioned into a, a spin one triplet state or space and a spin zero singlet state. Um, and you can see that the, the states I'm using are just the, the three triplet states there with their respective like S said values. And the reason for using this, this mapping is that even though it's not necessarily the most compact, um, it does give a good correspondence between your spin operators and your qubit operators, which is then um, much more beneficial for getting a low circuit depth when we consider time evolution under this Hamiltonian. So the next step in the algorithm is then to prepare the states that we're interested in. So as I said before, the muon is spin polarized along the z direction. So we just prepare the qubit in the zero state. And this is you know, very straightforward. For the nuclei, we want them to be in the maximally mixed state. Uh, and that's not necessarily immediately obvious how to do it. But essentially, we can achieve this by on you know, each iteration of the algorithm, just preparing all the nuclei in a randomly chosen S said basis state, where these you know, basis states are given by the Dickey states above, uh, and just choosing you know, a different one at random on each iteration of the algorithm. And it, you know, it sounds like it's straightforward to do, and the, the Dickey states certainly for spin one don't look very complicated. Um, but for higher spins, they're actually quite complicated to produce. Uh, and a good method wasn't really known for a, a long time, um, at least to, that I could find. Um, until this, this quite recent paper, this 2019 paper referenced at the bottom there, um, which puts forward a really like nice, elegant, inductive solution 
where which ultimately means you can build up these these dicky states we're interested in uh, in a depth that scales linearly with the the highest value of spin in your system. So you can imagine if you were trying to you know grow the size of your system, um, you know, this would just be a constant value. You wouldn't have to worry about it so much. We can then consider time evolution under the system Hamiltonian. Um, so for example, in this work, I'm going to be interested in a dipolar Hamiltonian that has n squared terms. You can use whatever your favorite algorithm is for, for time evolution. In this case, I focused on trotter type methods because those have previously been seen to work well for spin problems. Um, and you know, even the bound given here is, is a very loose one. It doesn't take into account like commutativity between any of the terms. But you can see that even with this like really loose upper bound and like numerically, I've, I've checked that this is very loose and you can do orders of magnitude better than this. Um, you can see that this isn't like horrendous in practice. And then finally, we just need to, to measure the muon spin, which we can either do through direct sampling, which uh, doesn't need any additional circuit depth, but um, you know, it might be a bit slow and need a lot of samples. Um, or if, if we want something a bit quicker, we can um, consider using these amplitude amplification type methods, um, which you know, require much fewer samples, but you need a much longer coherent circuit depth available. So perhaps not, not a NISC technique. So overall then, um, you know, I think it's quite a, a simple algorithm to describe and it kind of naturally lends itself to trying to do some, some numerical emulations. So the system that I was considering here uh, was a muon interacting with fluorine nuclei. Um, as I say, this has been studied many times within the muon literature. Uh, they just interact via a, a dipolar interaction. Um, and the, the systems that I'll be talking about in this work were three up to, to 21 spins, but I, I went all the way up to, to 29 spins in the end. Um, but you know, the data today will just focus on, on these three cases. Um, so the system that I was looking at that, that has this particular muon fluorine interaction um, was a muon implanted in a crystal of calcium fluoride. Um, the reason for this is twofold. Uh, one, there was some experimental data available, which made that you know, very attractive as a candidate. And um, two, the calcium nuclei in that system have almost all, almost all of them have spin zero. So you can kind of ignore them from the perspective of the calculation and just consider the muon interacting with this um, simple um, cubic lattice of fluorine nuclei. Um, so here is like a, a simulated polarization function compared to the experimental data for this system. Um, the experimental data was not taken by me. Um, this was very kindly provided by um, Steve Blundell and John Wilkinson um, in Oxford. Um, and what I was trying to do with this simulation was basically the same process as what I described earlier for the, the fluorinated molecular magnet. It was to optimize the, um, the geometry of the system to take into account what the effect of the muon is on its um, surrounding environment. And you can see that, you know, at least from by eye, the, uh, the simulated data gives a really good fit to the experimental data. And what we find is like having a look at the parameters um, that you get out of this fit, they're in you know, pretty good agreement with a recent state-of-the-art classical calculation um, that also came from, from Steve Blundell's group. And what they do in that work um, is to do exact diagonalization but on just an 11 spin system. And then they uh, weight or slightly change the interaction strengths between the muon and the most distant fluorines so that those fluorines act as a proxy um, for like the, the rest of the fluorines that they're not accounting for in the calculation, um, which is you know, a really nice technique. And I think that could be incorporated um, very naturally into the, the quantum algorithm here as well. But you know, the, these calculations were performed using a, a noiseless quantum circuit simulator. And we know well that you know, the, um, the quantum computers we're going to have available in the next few years are almost certainly going to have some levels of noise present in them. And so it's natural to ask how well this, this fitting procedure does if the, day, if the simulated polarization points are noisy as well. Um, so here I added some normally distributed noise to each of the data points and now considered fitting the polarization function for the 11 spin system. And you can see that at very high noise rates in the top plot, um, you know, some of these data points are off, but interestingly, we still like broadly capture the, the overall shape of the data, which is reassuring. 
And as the noise is decreased, we get a better and better approximation. And thinking about this a bit more quantitatively, uh, you can consider what the error is in the geometric fitting parameters as a function of the noise strength on any individual data point. And if we look at the top plot here, what we see is that the fractional error in the distance between the muon and its nearest neighbor fluorine nuclei is about a factor of 10 smaller than the fractional error in any individual data point. So that is you know, a very pleasing thing to see. The, the error in the quantity that we're interested in is actually smaller than the error in any individual data point, like you know, the physical noise level that we're dealing with here. Um, and I think that's not something we would necessarily expect to see, for example, from a BQE calculation, where we are interested in you know, just one single data point. Whereas here, because we're interested in some like global property of the curve, um, we're kind of getting this additional noise robustness, which I think is, is a nice feature and points to maybe this experimental data analysis approach as being quite a good um, application of, of noisy quantum machines. But one thing you might you know, notice, as I said, the noise is, is normally distributed about each data point, and I just added that noise manually. Um, would we actually get that noise from a, a quantum circuits simulation or you know, implementation of the algorithm? And the answer is not necessarily. So this is um, a much smaller system, the three spin system now uh, in a fold circuit simulation with uh, depolarizing single qubit noise after each of the gates. There are about 1500 gates in the circuit and you can see that even at you know, very low depolarizing noise values, um, we're getting like a significant damping of the polarization function. The values are changing a lot and certainly the points aren't normally distributed about the true value. Now, fortunately, there are ways to, to deal with this. So here I use this um, exponential Richardson extrapolation method of error mitigation, where you direct, um, deliberately boost the noise rates a little bit and then extrapolate back to the zero noise case. And you can see that if we do that, um, the, the resulting expectation values are you know, very nicely distributed around the true value um, and have quite a small error rate, even though you know, the overall circuit error rate is close to like, one error per circuit. Um, and this isn't necessarily surprising. This is the kind of regime where we've seen these error mitigation techniques working well in the past. So then kind of armed with, with I guess, all of these numbers, we can ask what, what resources might I need to, to do these calculations? So from a NISC perspective, if I focus on the 11 qubit system, uh, because that's the one I could get the tightest trotter error bounds from, from numerically, um, with 40 trotter steps, which I find is what what's kind of necessary for this problem and a, a pretty basic compilation. I think it's possible to do a lot better than this. Um, you need, still need about 40,000 two qubit gates. So if we're trying to get to that regime of, of one error per circuit, this looks pretty hard to do on, on NISC machines. Um, and it, it leads me to question how applicable this, this may be. But I think that's, you know, it, it's the same broad challenge that's facing all of these NISC computational chemistry algorithms. Um, noise is always going to prove a big barrier for us. If we move into considering perhaps like a small, small error corrected calculation, um, so this is just like a rough back of the envelope attempt at a surface code calculation. Um, you find you need about 2 million T gates for this small problem. Again, this could probably be dropped quite a bit. If I try and optimize for space using the full, smallest footprint possible, use reasonable physical error rates, but perhaps quite optimistic logical error rates inspired by the the, the circuit level noise simulations, you find you need about 20,000 physical qubits and the algorithm takes six minutes to run. So that doesn't sound horrendous until you consider that, you know, we need to take maybe 10,000 shots to measure each data point accurately. You need to take 100 data points along the curve and you need to calculate this curve at loads of different parameter values. So if each time of running the circuit takes six minutes, this whole you know, process is gonna take days. And this sounds pretty bad for the algorithm, and it's you know it's a big challenge that needs to be overcome. And I think it's a challenge facing you know a lot of algorithms in the field. We we often present um, you know for example we'd say it would take a few days to run phase estimation on an interesting molecule, um, and you know those are those are calculations that are incredible and they've come a long way in recent years, and that's like incredible state of the art work. But we need to consider that you know is running phase estimation once enough to solve a given problem, or if you know I want to um, 
optimize a molecular geometry, maybe I need to run phase estimation many, many times, you know, hundreds of times perhaps, in order to get the, the optimized molecular geometry, in which case is, you know, is it reasonable that my algorithm takes a few days to run? And perhaps we need to find ways of, of really speeding these things up a lot or considering the fact that um, you know, maybe a minimal optimized for space quantum computer um, might not be enough for us. So yeah, in conclusion then, hopefully what I've shown is that you know, analyzing experimental data could be an interesting problem for us to solve. It can lead to quite straightforward algorithms that appear to have a degree of noise robustness, but that you know, all quantum simulation algorithms are probably gonna face um, a challenge of having a very large number of repetitions. And this will either lead to having a long run time for the algorithm, or you know, we're gonna have to consider having more qubits or working to develop ways of speeding up the calculation, um, things like single shot error correction um, or you know, other, other approaches we haven't thought of just yet. Um, so yeah, that's, that's everything from me and I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. All right, I see Nathan had a question in the chat. Do you wanna ask it? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, Sam. Hey. I, I like this paper a lot when, when I saw it on the archive. Oh, cheers. Yeah. Um, so mine's probably a bit more related to quantum chemistry, but the, the Dicky states I know are forming the spin adapted, um, so, so the spin eigenfunctions. So I was wondering if you thought about maybe parameterizing them to form the configuration state functions in quantum chemistry as an ansatz, perhaps. Um, I can't say I have. Um, what I would say is that from memory, the circuit that gets used to uh, build them really exploits, as at least as much as I can remember, it, it exploits quite a lot the um, the symmetry between like all the coefficients in the Dicky state. So I don't know if it's possible to just tweak that algorithm so that it would give you like I think it would be quite difficult to tweak so that it would have like the correctly weighted coefficients, perhaps. Thanks. All right, I had another question, Sam. Um, you might have already asked this in the talk, honestly, but uh, you know, you showed the plots with with and without the the circuit level noise, and I kind of noticed that the you know when you turn on the circuit level noise, the fluctuations are still in a very similar place to without. The only thing is that you know the entire signal gets damped. I guess I was kind of wondering, like, what would constitute something that is beyond classical and of use to the experiment? Do you really need to get the amplitudes here, or is it just picking the, the peak position good enough? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, yeah, broadly, we want the, the correct frequency, I guess, of, of these oscillations. Um, so I guess the question is, is in, the, in these damped curves, is the frequency also changing with the damping? Um, like, I feel like it is perhaps a little bit, but um, yeah, it, it, that is a good question. Yeah, I guess it'd be interesting to like consider like a Fourier transform of, of the data set and see what that looked like instead. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you're looking at like, you know, if you're already having problems with the number of points you have to take, probably like Fourier transforming might be a bit difficult. You might just want to, I mean, you might just want to look at doing some kind of curve fitting or period extraction technique, which, yeah. uh, um, but I mean, it, this is this is kind of something that we, we found out recently where a lot of the time was that um, often quantum devices are much better at picking frequencies than they are at, um, at picking amplitudes. Ah, okay, interesting. I mean, just because they're, they're less affected by spam and, and by errors such as this, right? Right. Yeah. Well, 